If I think about the, uh, the work that you're doing here and the project of this seminar, uh, the, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, the fact that my work does not automatically relate to urbanism. Um, and, uh, and I'll explain that, which is that I think when one thinks about a political or a social project, um, one thinks first and foremost about urbanism. That is where a political realm uh, is most available um, and where actions are most possible. And um, in, in uh, my thinking, uh, urbanism has, this sounds harsh, but I'll just say it, urbanism has taken up all the air in the room around political action. Um, and so when one talks about a political possibility within architecture, the way the architecture lobby is and the way I am, uh, you want to put the political in our own work, as in how we produce what it is, not what it is that we produce. That's what I, I really think about the, the work that the lobby does. You have to be conscious about how you produce it and not just evaluate it on what you've produced. And for the most part, urbanism talks about what we've produced, um, how architects and urban planners and urban designers have made things badly, well, changeable, should be changed. Um, and clearly that is uh, hugely important around our responsibility. But again, I feel that it often elides the discussion of how, how it is that we came to the, do that work. And that's both um, the hierarchy of decision making, um, who, who's consulted, um, whose vision it was, who got paid, what allegiances allowed those decisions to be the ones. Um, that, that's what, what I um, want to focus attention on. And I think those things are political. Um, and I, again, I think we don't shed enough light on those things. Having said that, I know, I absolutely know, and that's why I'm so interested in, in um, this week, that there is a relationship between how it was produced and what is produced. And um, I feel that um, the, uh, certainly the discussions that happen on the first panel besides mine, um, which is, who's consulted, <laughs> really who, who, not just who you're doing it for, um, but um, who's brought into the process matters. Um, certainly when you do community-based work, I think that um, brings together the users with the decision makers. That's, that's healthy. Um, that's important, um, and um, that's one way of thinking about um, the uh, proper democratic cons consultation of the process. Um, so I, I like that. And then today, with the mapping, I feel, too, that that becomes part of what it is that we architects present ourselves with so that we know how to ask the right questions and go about the process in the right way. So that's another indication where how, how you do the work um, and what you bring into that affects what it is that you produce. Um, so I feel like this week is, is um, proof about that connection which matters to me and that because I've maybe artificially made a distinction, we work on how it is you work <laughs> and because everyone else works on how, what it is that we work, um, it's good to um, be made aware of, of that connection.
I can keep going. I'll just say one other thing, which is that I, I, I tend to th also think that um, uh, community-based work and community consultation, um, again, can be seen as the only way that the how we do the work gets politicized. As in, if you're concerned about that, you ask, you ask the community. Um, and again, I just want to remind people that even, even when you have a traditional practice that's not about um, community-based consultation, that there still is a politics in that. There still is a politics. And so that's not the only way. Um, so I, you know, I, I, um, I'm, I'm just coming back to um, locating a politics that, um, that motivates myself and the architecture lobby that might look different than the other, the other work that the panel is showing, but, um, but I also see that there's a connection. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that asymmetry, um, I think there are two sides to that asymmetry, and um, one is um, the, the fact that we um, want to produce things that make a better democratic society, um, and yet the, um, the way that most architecture firms are, are um, organized um, are completely undemocratic. Um, very hierarchical, very top-down, very precarious. Um, most people don't have a say in the kind of work that they're be going to be doing. They don't have a say in their hours. So there's a real asymmetry in what we propose for society and how we enact it. Um, so that's one of the asymmetries. Um, the, other, the other asymmetry is within the space of production, um, the, um, the hierarchies that are within it, um, whether you're thinking about um, education as a place of production, um, as a place that educates us architects about what it means to be an architect, um, what it means to enter into the institution of the profession, what it means to enter into the institution of the academy. Um, those, whether it's the firm or the academy, is so top-down, is so extremely top-down in a way that we never discuss. Um, who owns the firm, who makes the decision, who, who runs the academy, um, what their interests are in selecting the departments that they support, the um, deans that they uh, hire, um, the faculty that is allowed, who's promoted. We think of that all as a meritocracy. If you're good, you rise, but we know that it's not, it's not. And so just within the space of production, there's an asymmetry. So. It's those, it's those two. It, I think it is a global problem. I really, I really do. Um, and it might, it might be particular to architecture or architecture might have its own particular form of that because it um, is a profession that takes so much money to build um, and so much power to influence the right people to get a project done. Um, whether it's a building or whether it's an urban place. And um, so power is maybe more Im embedded in our discipline than other places. Um, but if we go to the academy, I, I'm, not, I'm curious to think through whether what I've just said translates to the academy about how um, a university supports an architecture program differently perhaps than than other programs, um, medicine or whatever. But I think I've answered my own question, which is, you know, like at Yale, basically the School of Medicine runs the university because it brings in so much money, the grants that it brings in. And so we do know there is a relationship between those things, whereas I know that architecture at Yale is the most expensive department. 
We don't pay for ourselves. The university has to support us. And it's made the commitment to support us. But you can still see that it sets up a dynamic of, oh my gosh, we will support these orphans. And we will really, really, really support medicine and make a lot of policies that make sure that they keep bringing the rants. It just is the case. It just is the case. But I also want to describe some, something else, which is um, having taught in New Zealand as well, um, there is a difference. And I do feel that for all of the difficulties that, that I experience, or that we all experience um, at, at a university like Yale, which is very well endowed and has lots of money um, and is a private institution, um, at New, in New Zealand, um, it's it's not a meritocracy. I I really do think that um, for all those difficulties, if you're a good teacher, um, there um, there might be obstacles if you're a woman. There might be obstacles if you don't have the right um, connections, but it's still it does get recognized in some way. Whereas I feel like in New Zealand. It's so bureaucratic, it's so unbelievably bureaucratic that a live wire <laughs> will have a hard time rising. So there, there is a difference, I'm going to just say. But, um, I teach studio, design studio, um, and I have teach at all different levels. Uh, this year I taught second year, the year before I taught first year, the year before that, I did first. The year after that, I did third. Before that, I did undergraduate. I've, I teach studio at all different levels. Um, and then I uh, teach always a, a theory course um, that basically has to do with contemporary theory. Um, and yeah, so there's always, each semester is, is a studio and a theory course. So. I wanted to come to Sao Paulo, I have to say, and I was curious to, to see how here in Brazil one was thinking through labor. And I thought it was really interesting that we were, you were putting together architecture labor with urbanism. And again, you know, partly because in my head um, it's not an obvious connection to think of architecture labor what it is that we do, what you ask architects to do, how is it they're producing it, how do you concern yourself with the fact that we're precarious, that kind of subjectivity. It's not automatic for me to see how you connect that with the urban project. Um, so I was curious to see um, that. Um, and in some way it's being fulfilled you know, for, for me. Um, so, um, it's interesting, uh, the, um, like David's presentation today and the, and the mapping of, of, the, of the airport um, reminded me very much of, of projects that we were doing um, in, in the 80s um, that didn't have so much focus on labor but focused on the hidden apparatuses that affect our bodily behavior and affect our subjectivity um, in ways that we don't know. Um, but again, there wasn't necessarily a labor side to that. There was more a user subjectivity that was um, being implicated. Um, and then um, more recently, the work that Who, Who Builds Your Architecture does really does do a mapping about who contracted that work, who designed it, who carried it out, what was exported, what was imported, basically describing how um, you could never identify who was responsible for the really slave labor that was happening. You know, that, that contractor who actually got the workers over here is a subcontractor to the building contractor, and the building contractor has a very diff distant relationship to the owner. The owner has a really distant relationship to the architect. 
they really do map that. And so that, that is a part of discussion that I've seen. Um, and then maybe more specifically, since um, Trump's election and the whole idea of infrastructure has come to the fore, supposedly he's supporting infrastructure, but if we all know that the very first infrastructure that he's doing is the building of the border wall, now there is a whole um, set of eyes, architectural eyes, um, looking at what that um, request for proposals is bringing up, what architecture firms are doing it, um, what, what they think they're contributing to that, um, who's going to carry it out. Um, so it's not the kind of mapping because it hasn't been built yet, but it's definitely a mapping of um, who's asking who to do it, who's responding and how in order to link responsibility. Um, so um, I think there's a new awareness there um, between um, what labor we're willing to do, <laughs> really what labor are we willing to do, um, so. Um, well, my, my, my main impression is the vitality of the city, all the people, everywhere. Um, it's so vital. Um, there are many cities that you go and certain neighborhoods are, um, are active, but then you go to the downtown and it's empty shops and nobody. So that what, what it strikes me about all the places I've been is like, there's a vitality everywhere. All the spaces are used um, in a um, completely, whether it's informal or formal way, it's happening. But the layering of um, of um, buildings that are informally occupied <laughs> with buildings that are institutionally occupied right on top of each other is really incredible. Um, and uh, it makes me think that the bottom up is allowed to coexist with the top down here um, in a way that I think is interesting. And I, and I know that you, I mean, I assume that you think that it's very problematic that the um, city can tolerate um, that mix, but it seems very vital to me. I don't know. Um, I, th I think it, um, it very much depends on where you are. Um, I did notice yesterday when, when we were reviewing um, that one or two of the people whose project had already been reviewed were distracted and, and, and texting, um, but not many. Um, and um, you would see the same thing, I, I think, where I teach. Um, um, I'm personally one who will tell, ask the student to leave. It's kind of like either, either you're here paying attention or you're not. Um, but um, uh, classes that I've been in in, in New Zealand, half, half the class is texting and no one says anything. Um, so d clearly I think it's a problem um, to do that. <laughs> and um, how pervasive it is, I, I think really just depends on the institution. Um, I, I can't make a blanket statement about, about that. But I have to say I've been surprised at the, at the projects that I've seen um, that I haven't seen one that brings in digital technology as its subject matter. They might use digital to document something. So in the representation, it comes up, but nobody has used it as a subject matter. Um, and that's an, that, that would not be the case in the United States. Um, that, that the notion of a public um, hasn't included social media and, and that the public is not what it used to be. I mean, I think there's a fairly traditional notion of the public here. Yeah.